Good evening. evening. Welcome to worship as we gather as God's people at the foot of the cross. Here we will see our Lord go in our stead and for our sins. And there we will see why. We will hear why. That it is for great love that none would be lost. We gather to also witness the drama of the night. You will hear the story told, the passion narrative of our Lord. We will have an opportunity to contemplate, to think about it, to think deeply before we gather again on Sunday morning to celebrate the resurrection. This service will be mainly given to you to receive, but also an opportunity to respond with hymns and song and prayer. And so we begin, you may remain seated, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. From Isaiah chapter 53. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he has taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished." He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Thank you. 
Jesus on this night settle all distractions. Focus our ears, our hearts, and our minds on all that you've done. We ask this in your name. Amen. The way of love. We have been marching towards this spot all 40 days of Lent. We have been hearing the law of God from Moses, each of the Ten Commandments being explained in a simple way each week of Lent, and now the conclusion, and it brings us to the cross. For the law, which is good and right, cannot save us. It stands only to condemn us. It is good and right because it is the way of love. It's how God is loved. It is how we are loved. But our hearts are far from it. We join together in Psalm 119, reciting the words of the psalmist who loves God's law. I meditate on it. It is a light to my path. And yet it is this very law that stands to condemn us. Together, you have dwelt well with your servant. O Lord, according to your word, teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You are good and do good, Teach me your statutes. The insolent smear me with lies, but with my whole heart I keep your precepts. Their heart is unfeeling like fat, but I delight in your law. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Tonight we conclude with the final commandments. You may have been wondering where they've been. We went just a little bit out of order. We, we left stealing behind, but I wanted to bring it in with the final two of coveting. For stealing is what the hand does, coveting is what the heart does, but it is all the same. It is a desire. I want, I cannot have, or can I? I'm going to ask a very personal question, please don't answer. Have you ever stolen anything? I have. I was less than five years old. I was somewhere around four years old. Small town Oberlin in the grocery store. You have not this large, but you have candy that's just out there. You can take a piece and then you pay for it. Unless you just want it. And then... Even at the tender age of four, you know that you need to conceal what you've just taken. I took it. I took it home. And then I began to enjoy my delights. But I was four. I was not very smart. And my mom asked me, hey, what are you eating? Where'd you get that? Oh, I didn't think of that next answer. I got it at the grocery store, and she knew how then I how had to get it. She didn't pay for it. My whole world started on fire at that moment. And my own mom, and she's probably watching online, my own mom threatened to call the police and turn her son in as a thief. I remember this vividly, even though I'm 56, almost 57 now. I remember the account and the incident. 
It has stick, stuck with me all of these years. The feelings, the emotions of panic, the dread, the fear of God in that moment that I would be turned over, you know, incarcerated in some way. That experience had a very big impact on my life. I have never even attempted to steal anything since. But coveting, well, that's something different, isn't it? Perhaps you can keep your hands from taking what is not yours, but to see something and desire it seems so natural in that you have to have something to live in. You have to wear some kind of accoutrements and clothing, and you have to have something to sit on, a, a kitchen to make things, and food to prepare. You need a certain amount of things. And then you see your neighbor who has better things. Or you just peruse the internet, and you see other people's lives having great things and great vacations. Everybody on Facebook has a much better vacation than we do. They're having a much better life, much happier. It is hidden and couched in the normal desires that one needs to exist in this life, but what goes beyond what God has given us is that I want this more than I want God. Because this, whatever this is, will make me happy. It will complete me. And I still fight that desire within my heart, knowing that this next thing, yes, will make me happy. It will satisfy. It will justify my existence. It will complete me in every way, more than what God is and what God has given. And God has commanded that even that desire be put to death. Well, we find it is that desire in the garden. As a snake approaches Adam and Eve, suggests that, yes, your life is pretty good, but you know it could be better, so much better. Have you noticed that you're not God? Thought so. Wouldn't it be great if you were? Yeah, it would, wouldn't it? Desire for what we do not have. But it's more than simply that I want that. It's that I want that instead of you. I will be God. I will be wise. I will have what I want. And there a line has been crossed. And once it has been crossed, there is no way back. We are dead to God. Everything about our relationship with God is then over. The world is literally on fire. The only thing that we await for is the timing of when we will enter that fire. When I was four years old, and I felt the utter terror that the only person in my life that I knew loved me was going to now hand me over to the police, it left a mark on my soul that you can do things that will cut you off. That's why we find ourselves here at the foot of the cross. We have crossed that line. But the love of God has not stopped. Yes, the world is on fire. Yes, we have chosen other than God, but He still chooses us. As a four-year-old, you don't understand that the reason your mom has gone nuts is because she loves you, and she doesn't want you to go down that path because it only leads to suffering and death. And so our God went down the road of suffering and death to redeem us, to call us back to life and to Himself so that our hearts would be satisfied with the one thing that can satisfy, the one delight that truly brings delight now and forever, and that is Himself. 
He will go into death and into the fire, into being cut off from God himself, that we will be his own. Stand at the foot of the cross as we do right now and hear the good news. You are loved. You have never been stopped loving by God. He's never stopped loving you. He has gone into the fire for you to redeem you. You are His. He will never leave or forsake you. You are safe with Him. In the rest of the world, apart from Him, there is no safety. There is only the eternal desiring and waiting for the next thing and manipulating and stealing and, and trying to find that, but it's not there. It is here with Jesus. Come, let us worship him. Let us hear his story of the cross. Amen. As we prepare to hear that story, as the lights will go out one by one into the darkness, we begin by offering God our tithes and our offerings and your attendance card at this time at the front of the church. John chapters 18 and 19. Jesus arrested. When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his, with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who had betrayed him, knew the place, because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said, and Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happens that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, Put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup my father has given me? Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jewish leaders 
that it would be good if one man died for the people.
Peter's first denial. Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. But Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple, who was known to the high priest, came back, spoke to the servant girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. You aren't one of this man's disciples too, are you? She asked Peter. He replied, I am not. It was cold, and the servants and officials stood around a fire they had made to keep warm. Peter was also standing with them, warming himself. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby slapped him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest, he demanded? If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Then Annas, Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing there, warming himself. So they asked him, You aren't one of his disciples too, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him, Didn't I see you with him in the garden? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, a rooster began to crow.
Jesus before Pilate. Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, they did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, What charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, they objected. This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate replied? Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? retorted Pilate. With this, he went out again to the Jews, gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him, but it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, No, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. Jesus, sentenced to be crucified. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flawed. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. 
they clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis of a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, We have a law, and according to that law, he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me, Pilate said? Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. But the Jewish leaders kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified.
the crucifixion of Jesus. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said one to another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. On my heart imprint your image. Blessed Jesus, King of grace, that life's riches, cares, and pleasures Never may your work erase. Let the clear inscription be, Jesus crucified for me. Is my life my hope's foundation and my glory and salvation? Please read together with me, uh, Psalm 22. My God, my God, why will you forsake me? Why will you so far from saving me? So far from my cries and anguish. My God, cry out by death, who you do not answer. I know that I find no rest. Yet you are the throne of the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you, your ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you, they cried out and were saved. In you, they trusted and were not put to shame. That I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They grow insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is turned to wax. It has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a pot soup and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment.
the death of Jesus. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath, because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies that you also may believe. These things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. The burial of Jesus. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. 